As I've mentioned in the past, the book of Ezekiel can be divided roughly into three parts. The first part describes God's visions to Ezekiel and the judgments and condemnations against Jerusalem and Israel. It's in this first part that we've been studying now for several months and had some really good insights from these messages. Now today we're going to begin in the second part of the book of Ezekiel, which begins roughly when the uh, king of Babylon returns a second time to lay siege to Jerusalem because of the rebellion and sin of Zedekiah. It's during this time where God turns his attention to the neighbors surrounding Jerusalem, his, the nations around Jerusalem, to warn them not to look too gleefully and happily upon the destruction of Jerusalem because their sins and their abominations will be punished as well. Their destruction is just as likely. God also warns them not to enter into the land of Israel because he is saving that land for the return of his children when they return from the exile. Now the third part of the book of Ezekiel begins roughly with the destruction of Jerusalem and the new second wave of exiles which are then deported to Babylon. It's during this time where God changes his tone. He becomes uh, more hopeful and more promising and gives people a future and a hope that they will return to their land. Now we're going through the book of Ezekiel more as a survey and less of a comprehensive uh, exposition of every single verse. So I need to tell you, we're going to be jumping from chapter 18 all the way to chapter 28 today. In chapter 28, we'll see uh, God's message to the proud king of Tyre. Now it's, clear, it's good for us to understand what we're skipping here. And so briefly, let's just go over that as quickly as we can. Remember chapter 18 took place uh, approximately in the sixth year of Ezekiel's exile that would put it about 591 BC. And that's what we learned about who pays for our sins. Now in chapter 19, which we'll be skipping, uh, God has a lamentation for the people, the fallen people of Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem. In chapter 20, it marks the seventh year of the exile of uh, Ezekiel in Babylon, which would be about 590 BC. And in this year, that's when the elders return to Ezekiel to inquire of the Lord. And God refuses to listen to their questions because of the rebellion in their hearts. This is very similar to what happened back in chapter 14 when the elders approached Ezekiel and God told Ezekiel that these elders have idols in their hearts. Chapter 21 is a parable about God's sword which is being unsheathed to bring destruction upon Jerusalem and all of southern Israel. Chapter 22 is more of judgments against Israel and this time he uses images, imagery of filth and blood and dross and wolves to describe the destruction that's coming upon Jerusalem. In chapter 23, it's another parable, this time about the twin sister harlots, Ohola and Oholaba. These sister harlots are described in their, their lured activities and their horrible and obscene behavior in great detail in this chapter and how they will be destroyed for their behavior. Chapter 24 marks another very important time in uh, the life of Israel because it's in chapter 24 that we learn that Jerusalem is now under siege by Babylon. This would be the year 588 BC and about the ninth year of Ezekiel's exile. Now to mark this historic event, God gives Ezekiel two very critical pictures to talk to the exiles about. The first one is a boiling pot, showing that the heat is being turned up around Jerusalem and its destruction is imminent. God also gives Ezekiel another picture to think about. And uh, unfortunately, Ezekiel's wife passes away, and God asks Ezekiel not to mourn for her, to show as an example of how shocked the people will be over the final destruction of Jerusalem. They will be in such shock that they will not even be able to mourn over this whole disaster. That's what God does for him at the, at the siege of Jerusalem. Now in chapter 25, God begins to talk about all the nations and surrounding Israel. In chapter 25, God gives us a warning against Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. These four short judgments are given as warnings to tell these people that their destruction is next and not to touch the land of Israel. Chapters 26 and 27 and 28 are all about the neighboring country of Tyre, the city of Tyre, the city-state of Tyre, and the destruction that's, that's eminent upon them as well. God describes how they are going to be destroyed. They're just a little seaport on the eastern side of the Mediterranean, but their pride has gotten so high that they too are destined for destruction. And he's going to describe that destruction in chapter 26. He tells them that Nebuchadnezzar is on his way 
and he is going to destroy them as well as destroy the city of Jerusalem. Uh, God prophecies that Nebuchadnezzar would destroy the city and that the city's, the city's uh, destructive material, all the, all the rubble of the city would be thrown into the sea and that the whole city would become a bare rock, so flat and so bare that the only thing it's good for is for drying fishermen's nets. Now, we should stop here for a minute and just explain that there's something interesting about this prophecy because this prophecy was clear, but it didn't happen all at once. Nebuchadnezzar did destroy the city of Tyre, but the people of the Tyre were very resourceful. They jumped in their boats and they took all their, their fortunes out to an island that was just basically out in the harbor of the port of Tyre. And it was far enough away that uh, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't get to them and make any, any dent in them. They, he couldn't destroy the rest of them from that time on. But God wasn't through with the city of Tyre because a mere 200 years later, Alexander the Great came through as his march of conquering the world and his march through the Mediterranean area. And he came to Tyre and asked for their surrender. And they said, no way. They, again, jumped in their boats. They went out to that island and they said, you can't get us. We're on an island. And Alexander said, oh, yes, I can. And he took all the destruction of that city and scraped it off all the way down to the foundation and used it to build a land bridge to the island, a causeway out to the island wide enough that he could go out there and destroy and burn that entire island and kill everybody. Well, there were a few that did escape, unfortunately, and they came back to rebuild Tyre. And they got a little ways rebuilding it back to its, its, its former glory, but not even close, because in the Middle Ages, another king coming through that area destroyed it in 1200 AD. So when God dis, uh, prophesies the destruction of a city, it is destroyed. In our minds, the soul of a human being loves prophecy because prophecy is something that shows us how divine God is. It's, it's God's voice speaking these words. It, gets, it tells us his Bible is true. It tells us we can trust in him because he holds the future in his hands. So that's chapter 26. Chapter 27 is another lamentation against the fall of Tyre, merely repeating much of the, what was spoken of in chapter 26. And then we reach chapter 28, which is our chapter for today. So let's pray together, and then we're going to go through God's description of the, or God's destruction uh, that he has planned for the proud king of Tyre. Heavenly Father, I pray for your spirit to guide us today, lead us in your truth, and show us and explain to us your word, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Chapter 28, verses 1 and 2, lifted up with pride, lifted up with pride, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods, in the heart of the seas. Let's stop right there. This is a horrible thing, pride. And when a man's pride creeps up from his soul and begins to possess his personality and take over his being, it is such an awful thing. There's so many things that happen when pride takes over the human soul. Uh, pride, it covers its tracks. When pride takes over a soul, it covers its tracks so well that you're not even aware of that pride. People with pride can't see their own pride. They have lost their ability. They are blinded to their own actions and attitudes and thoughts. Uh, people that are filled with pride do not even know their pride. Everybody around them can, knows they're proud and they avoid them, but they know, they can't know themselves that they are proud. A proud man's self-awareness disappears. He becomes totally blinded by that, and it's a horrible thing. People will not help you when you're, when you're filled with pride. Any attempt that somebody makes to, from your friends to help you with pride is just going to make you lose your friend. It's all it's going to do. So pride is something that only God can deal with. And we're going to see right here that God deals with this proud king because he has lifted up his heart. God says in verse 2, your heart is lifted up. This is a great picture of what happens in pride. You begin thinking more highly of yourself. You lose the ability to think humbly anymore. Persons corrupted with, uh, persons aware of their own corruption usually walk with a sense of humility. People that know their soul is corrupted can walk with humility. They know they are, they are cursed with sin and they walk lowly. They don't walk highly lifted up. They walk lowly. So uh, people that let the success go to their head, uh, they just they let it go to their head. What does that mean? It means that they have 
no longer had the sensibility to understand that their blessings have come from God. They're no longer thankful. They're no longer grateful. They now believe that everything is because of their own greatness. It's a result of their goodness and greatness. This is the danger of pride. It is so devastating. When pride takes over, there's really nothing else that can be done other than to wait for God's judgment. The king of Tyre's pride had become so lofty and so high that he actually went so far as to think he was a god. This is a very flagrant form of pride. And he believed that his town, his city that he had built with his own pride, has, has, has become the seat of gods. And it's the property of his own sovereignty. And he is now lord of the angry seas. This is a horrible description of this man's pride, this proud king of Tyre. What is God going to do? Well, let's pick it up in chapter, or in verse 2 through 5. Mockery from God. Mockery from God. Yet you are a man and not God, although you make your heart like the heart of God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. By your wisdom and understanding, you have acquired riches for yourself and have acquired gold and silver for your treasuries. By your great wisdom and by your trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. If you've ever wondered what it's like to be mocked by God, this is how it's done. And God is speaking in a way that he knows that this king's self-awareness is not even going to realize that he's being mocked. He's going to believe every word that's coming from God's mouth as he extols this proud king with these false, uh, false accolades. This king is just going to smile and just bask in the glory, not even realizing that God is mocking him terribly. In verse 3, God gives him some false praise, even letting him know that he is, he is wiser than Daniel. And Daniel, of course, was able to uh, go to God and discern the secrets of a secret dream of the greatest king in the world and God is mocking this king with this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, false, this false praise. Uh, he also took compliments him on his wealth and how his wealth was all gained by all his shrewdness and all his wisdom and all his intelligence. This, his riches were gained by his great power and his great savvy. Uh, this king is truly a wonderful king because he's so rich. The richness proves how great he is. And his greatness is because he's, his greatness was gathered. His greatness is what helped him gather his riches. It's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy for this poor king. And this is a disaster for anybody who has a proud heart. We have to watch out for that. Uh, God mockly, mocks him for his wealth and for his riches. This is horrible. You know, for our own lives, we, we have to be very careful about this because it's so easy to think that we are rich because we are so smart. We are so good. We are so great. Uh, our riches can be such that, something that puffs us up and we, goes to our heads. We have to watch out for that. Our riches are just merely something that God has put in our hands to be stewards of. It is not ours. We are merely stewards of it. And if we think it's ours, we are then destined for the same uh, destiny is this proud king. We have to be very careful that riches can help your pride take over your life and you can become blinded by it. Uh, this king failed the test. He didn't even sense that he was being mocked. He didn't see it as a rebuke whatsoever. He was not able to see the subtlety of this message and he was not able to take it to heart. There's only one thing left for this king. He has to be knocked out of his proud perch. And uh, pride of this level it's, it's destined for destruction. And his destruction was the destruction not only of himself, his life, but also his whole city. God will humble the proud and he will exalt the humble. That's a law of the universe that's even more accurate and more true than the law of gravity. Let's go on to verses 6 through 10. Pride judgments. Pride judgments. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God, Therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They will bring you down to the pit, and you will die the death of those who are slain in the heart of the seas. Will you still say, I am God, in the presence of your slayer, though you are a man and not God, in the hands of those who wound you? 
you will die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. Not much needs to be said about this. God is going to deal with this man's pride. Unfortunately, when pride gets this bad, when the cancer grows this malignant, it has to be destroyed by God alone, and he has a way of doing it through the hand of death. Death is what happens when pride gets this high. God has to step in and take over the matters. Recall that the New Testament book of Acts actually described another king who became so prideful that he was put to get death by the hand of the Lord in much the same way. This is Acts chapter 12, verses 21 through 23. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, The voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and was eaten by worms and died. What comes next in our story of this proud king of Tyre is a little bit of a mystery. God has already been speaking to us in what, would, what one would call uh, the voice of, of Hebrew poetry. He's been using uh, image rhyming to describe what's going to take place all through chapters 26 and 27 and now in 28. But he's going to change his voice. You're going to notice that he's going to now use a voice of imagery and mystery and mysticism and imagination that uh, really is hard to align with what we've just read about the proud king of Tyre. So listen carefully and, and let me know what you think. There's, going to be, there's come a language here that you're going to think is more like Perhaps this man was demonically oppressed by a, a, a satanic force. So let's listen to the lamentation against the king in verses 11 and 12. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord. So this is God using Ezekiel as a messenger and now turning to use Ezekiel as a songwriter. He's going to write a song of lamentation for the king. Verses 12 and 13, the king's perfection. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. As I said, huh, does this sound like he's talking to this king of Tyre any longer? Is he talking to the king of Tyre? It was the king of Tyre ever in Eden? Was the king of Tyre ever clothed by God himself with this kind of jewel and this kind of raiment? Never. This is kind of interesting. Who is God talking about? The king of Tyre was born of man, just like any other man. The king of Tyre was not created. God says that this guy was created, whoever he is. So who is this? Apparently this king uh, has a very high place of prominence in God's, uh, God's favor. God has actually prepared for him the clothing that he would wear on the day he was created to give him uh, such a favor and such a standing. So let's read more about this king, because this king is going to fall. This is verses 14 and 15, the king's fall. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. So is this the king of Tyre, or is this perhaps an angel? God says here that this person, this created being, was a cherub, like the cherubim that are sitting upon the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, cherubim had multiple wings. They used some wings to hide their eyes so that they wouldn't look upon the glory of God. They used their wings to shield others from seeing the glory of God. Uh, this was uh, the, the job of cherubs who were angels of God. So is this an angel that God is talking about? And this angel was walking on the mountain of God, a very privileged place. On, even describes it as being red coming up soon. The red fiery mountain of God is, is going to be talked about. So God is going to explain to us that this, this creature was blameless and holy and righteous and welcomed into God's presence himself. But this king changed at some point in created time and space, this king, or this angel, whatever it is, 
uh, took a change and his attitude and his essence from the very core of his being reversed and instead of being found filled with righteousness was being found instead with evil at his very essence. So verse 16 talks about the king's ejection. The king's ejection. By the abundance of your trade you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. God helps us understand here the process of this being's corruption. Somehow, a desire for more, a greed, entered his life, and he wanted more. It was probably gained through some economic trade that he wanted to uh, deal with, with created things of the world not with the eternal things of the world. He wanted to deal with things that were created, the precious things of this world. And he traded it, and he, he, was, he became a sinner because of that greed and because of that desire. So God had to cast him out of heaven. God threw him from the place. But where did he go? Where was this being sent to? Well, we find out in verse 17. The king's new abode, in verse 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. So along with pride comes vanity. There's many things that come along with pride. Vanity is a belief that because of your good looks, because of your appearance, because of your outward form, you are somehow better on the inside. That is vanity. And this, this king or this being was loaded with vanity. He believed that there was splendor in his looks. And it was because of that, he was lifted up. So we've got greed has corrupted him. And now also vanity has corrupted him. He has got all sorts of things going wrong with him. And his heart is so lifted up that God has to cast this evil king or angel down. It says you cast him down to the ground. But you might remember that the word ground here, as it used in many places in the scripture, is the same word used for earth. So it's being, he's being cast to the created earth. The, the earth below is where he's being thrown. And in verse 18, which we're going to look at right now, uh, it's, it's actually translated earth there. So this utter being of appalled wickedness is thrown down to earth. And why is he thrown down to earth? He's thrown down to earth because this is the place where people on the earth, or kings on the earth, it says, will look upon him and will just laugh. They will look upon him and will bring him shame. So if anybody knows the difference between the righteousness of God and the wickedness of evil and sin, they're just going to laugh because they will see this for what it is. Who on earth would shake their fist at God? Who on earth would rebel against the God of heaven? It's a futile, it's a futile event. It's a, it's a horrible thing to try. It's not going to get you anywhere. It will never succeed. So they laugh at this, this being that's been thrown out of heaven. It's a stupid being to have done what he tried to do. Verse 18, the king's destiny. By the multitude of your iniquities in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. Sin is never just one sin. It's always a collection of sins, sins that go together, sins that are working to destroy and ruin and corrupt and are violent and kill and lie and deceive and pervert. Sin always ruins everything. Uh, now, righteousness, on the other hand, can build things up, but sin always destroys everything it's involved in. And if sin is in a man's heart, this is what the final outcome will be. Sin will always lead to burning, ashes, destruction. Sin is a sin that will be destroyed. And sin in the heart of man will always destroy that man. Let's finish up with verse 19, our conclusion. As Satan trembles, Satan trembles. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have become terrified and you will cease to be forever. So ask yourself again, is this lamentation over a puny little king of Tyre in his puny little city on the eastern coast of a mediocre sea of the Mediterranean Sea, is this just that king or is there something more to this? There seems like there's something more to this because this the lamentation is against some being that has been offered the privilege of far more glory than any other human being has ever been given. 
this king or this angel, it sure sounds like the enemy of God or Satan himself. Cast out of heaven, sent down to earth to be humiliated, Satan takes advantage of this situation and brings sin and corruption into the world through Adam by deceiving Adam, and Adam welcomes in this sin and brings corruption to the world. This world has two huge problems. The first is that the world doesn't believe in God. There's so many people today that don't even believe there is a God that is so disastrous for everyone because the only way people can find salvation for the curse of sin and the sentence of death that's upon their lives is by turning to God. God is the only one, and we must believe he exists, and we must trust him that he knows how to take care of this problem. This is how the writer of Hebrews puts it in Hebrews 11.6. He says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. This is our first problem. We have the curse of sin upon our lives. We have the death sentence for that sin by God's righteousness upon our souls. Sin will be punished and we will be destroyed right along with the burning sin in our lives. We need God's power. We need to put our trust in Him and find the freedom that comes when God takes over our lives. He wants to live within us and bring us the power of eternity in our hearts, the abundance of, of life within us again so we can have a victory over sin in our lives. That's the only way we can find this victory in, in, in our lives is through the transforming, redeeming power of God. The Apostle John put it this way in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The second problem is just as dire. Not only do people in this world fail to believe in God, they also fail to understand how dangerous Satan is. He is the true enemy of God, and the problems that we, have in our, that we face in this world, the lies, the deception, the murder, and the violence, the corruption that we are always battling against every single day, even in our own souls, is because of sin in this world and because Satan is the ruler of this world. Unless we're educated to that fact, we will continue to be influenced by his power and we will fall and fall into the danger of our own condemnation. This world must wake up and understand that there is a battle going on. Satan is warring against God and we are that battleground. We must turn and escape from Satan's power and we only escape by turning to God. We must be educated to who, who Satan is and what he does in this world. That was, that was Peter's desire when he told his elders in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Remember, it was Peter's confession of faith in God, whom he believed in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, that led Jesus to claim victory over Satan himself, and know, knowing that the gates of hell would not prevail over his church. Listen to this from Matthew 16, 18. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Thankfully, the more people understand the wiles and schemes of Satan, the more Satan trembles. With a proper understanding, we can find our salvation in God. We can be free. We can understand that sin is the opposite of righteousness, that evil is the opposite of the goodness of God, that we can turn to the good and seek after the good and seek God. If people fail to find refuge in God, they will become so depraved that they will even think that our problems are due to God and blame God, whereas God loves us and wants us to be saved and come to a knowledge of our Savior. We must learn from this lamentation against the proud, Tyre, proud king of Tyre. Pride is a dangerous sin. It is the most horrible of all of our sins. Pride is our pathway to the burning destruction of hell. We must get away from it as much as possible as we can. Do not be so naive as to think that this world isn't under the power of Satan. It is under the power of Satan, and we are, would be wise to understand that and to work against it as much as we know how. 
We have this time right now where Jesus is offering this world a second chance. We must be bold. We must be brave. We must tell this world about the good hope that they have in God. There is a message of hope for this crazy world. They must repent and turn to God. They must find their salvation in the God of mercy who loves them. They must turn and serve and follow the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that this message of hope would penetrate the hearts of those who are imprisoned by the power of Satan and that they would find the release and freedom that comes in turning their lives over to the truth of Jesus Christ. All this, Father, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.